Welcome to Computer Science. I'm streaming now live on Twitch. Uh, recordings will go to YouTube. Uh, so that will prove useful to you guys later. Um, okay, so we'll just kind of go through a couple of quick sort of uh, syllabusy kind of things. Uh, Canvas is a little bit broken at the moment, so I've got a few things to, to finish uh, and I'll publish it later today. Uh, the two TLDRs that uh, you definitely need to know are, well, what's the very first thing you talk about in a class? When's the final? Which you guys actually kind of got a pretty decent final time, namely the very first time. Um, and we're not going to do a final exam. Uh, is anybody upset about that? No? Pretty cool? But we'll do projects instead and we'll do a thing during that time, so uh, it should be fun. There'll be donuts and coffee, so um, yeah, we'll talk about that later. And then on a Saturday afternoon, this is one of the things that had to go thanks to the pandemic, but finally we can do it again. Um, every, well, semester, but especially in the spring, I do a uh, Saturday uh, afternoon thing for kids at the Carnegie Museum, which has anybody ever been to it? It's, it's, you know, the, the, the sketchy Valero that's got the laundromat in it. It's right across the street from that. Um, oh, that, that's, that Valero is super sketchy. Um, so I knew it was ultra sketchy. I went in to get a drink one day and I'm standing in line to pay and, you know, by the checkout, they've got like, let's just say paraphernalia. And, you know, for totally for tobacco only use um, and inside the case that had all the paraphernalia, there was also like um, if you needed a clean sample, you could purchase that. Yeah. And I was like, OK, that's kind of creepy. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Um, OK, so we'll do that on Saturday afternoon. We've I've already got this scheduled with the museum and you guys and my other two classes will be there and. Basically, we'll set up cool stuff for kids and have fun for a few hours. So, um, should be kind of cool. Um, all right. Um, the syllabus stuff you guys can go through once I publish the Canvas course. Um, but, so I guess what I want to do for the rest of the time is today is just kind of give you a brief overview as to what computer science is all about. Nope. That. Oh, I never installed OpenOffice on here. Okay, well, that would be my stupid mistake. Do that real quick. Um, <clears throat> so, the, the point of this sort of course is to give you a broad introduction to what computer science is as a modern discipline. And there are lots of different um, parts of it. Um, and essentially what we're going to do is kind of spend um, kind of a few weeks on each of the major parts of computer science. We won't hit everything. We certainly won't be able to go into full detail about everything. Um, and so, for example, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about algorithms, what they are, how you analyze them, and so on, which is an entire course in the CS major. Um, and so obviously we can't do all of it in a week and a half, but we can at least get a taste for what, what, it, uh, what it's all about. Um, and we're going to start with sort of a bottom up approach, meaning on, well, how many of you guys have ever actually built or taken apart a computer, right? So if I gave you a pop quiz and handed you a bunch of parts and said, put it together, most of you would not have any clue what goes where. Okay. Well, good. Um, because guess what we're going to do on Wednesday? We're going to bring in a cartload of old broken computers. You're going to take them apart. You're going to put them back together. And in doing so, you'll know what all the parts are. Um, and then we'll start talking much more low level uh, about how a computer in, is actually constructed uh, using uh, things called transistors. And... Um, how you build basically start to build a computer from the ground up in a, in a circuit kind of sense. Um, so you guys will get your hands dirty with some electronics. Um, now, just out of curiosity, has anybody done any programming of any sort before? 
Tail, I know you have, yeah. Uh, yay, nay. Anybody did website design in high school? A little bit of HTML. Okay, what about, uh, was anybody on a robotics team in middle school or high school? Yeah, what language did you guys use? Java, okay. Did anybody use Scratch when you were a kid? Yeah? Um, or the Lego uh, robotics language? Or any of these block-based languages where you put together little blocks, almost like you're putting Legos together? Okay, how many of you guys played with Legos when you were kids? Okay, good, excellent. There's one of the advantages of working at an all-male institution is that you can reasonably assume the answer to that question is yes. Um, so, um, anyway, um, so the, the kind of broad strokes in terms of the areas that we want to think about are what is a computer on a hardware level, right? It's not just a magic box. There's something going on inside. What is that, that something? Um, also, uh, you know, once you have a machine, how do you, what does it mean to program it? What languages in which do you program in? There are hundreds, right? What's similar about all of them? What's different about many of them? Um, what are sort of the requirements that a language has to have some core minimum to do useful things? Um, but then also sort of here's a, it starts, I guess, as a philosophical question, but um, is it possible to compute anything? What does that even mean? Right, so are there limits somehow to what is computable, no matter how big and fast and fancy a computer you've got? Like, and when I say that, okay, if you say it's computable, but it'll take a billion years, that's still computable. Now, that's not practical by any stretch of the imagination, but it's still computable. Um, are there things that no matter how big and fast and fancy a computer you've got, you could never compute them, period? Um, turns out, yes, which is a surprising, and maybe in some respects, um, <clears throat> but maybe also not surprising in, in depending on how you think about it. Um, so we'll talk about that in sort of the the, the theory that underlies the, the, the discipline. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the history of computer science, which may seem old, but to some extent, computer science is a discipline that's about 200 years old. Um, and you could argue that maybe it's only 70 years old um, in some sense. Uh, I'll, I'll take 200 as sort of a good rough guide to it um, because well, 200 years ago, what was computing like? Mr. Bullock, I'm going to look at you because I expect you to know some history of your own country. Very little. Very little. Well, who was king? Yeah. Who was the sovereign in 1820? Yeah, it's probably George the Third. Was there a George the Fourth? I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, um, but have you heard of uh, Charles Babbage? Has anybody ever heard of Charles Babbage? None of you? Ah, okay. Well, that's interesting. Uh, what about a, a maybe a, a, not 100 years ago, this would be, my, say, 60 to 80. What about Alan Turing? Okay. Uh, how many of you guys have seen the movie The Imitation Game? Good movie? Great movie? What'd you think? You haven't seen it? Oh, it's a must watch. Uh, it's, it's actually really good. Um, so, uh, you know, in some, some respects, you could say that modern computing started with Charles Babbage in, and he was in the sort of early to mid 19th century. And one of the problems that, that, um, people had in terms of calculation back then. Um, think back to when you were in elementary school. Okay, so in elementary school, I really did not care for math. I was good at it, but I didn't really care for it. And why? Because it was a bunch of tedious arithmetic and doing long division by hand 
And I don't know about you guys, but that's boring. Okay. Uh, and it's tedious. And when you're a kid, you make mistakes and your handwriting sucks and you get frustrated and you want to cry and you can't go to recess because you haven't gotten your math problems done or, um, so like, think back to when you had to do arithmetic by hand. And of course, nowadays, like, please tell me you guys all know how to do long division by hand. You still do. Okay. You better. Um, uh, okay, okay, so fine, we'll reboot. Um, so um, that's tedious, right? And it's pretty tedious if you're trying to do grade school arithmetic. So imagine, well, how many of you guys have taken like physics, well, or chemistry, right? All right, now imagine that you have to do every computation for that class and calculators haven't been invented yet. You have to do it literally all by hand. Okay, that would suck, wouldn't it? Yeah, and it would be extremely slow and extremely tedious. So back in the day, calculator or computer was not a machine, but a job title. Um, and you would hire people to do this. And it was almost like blue collar labor if you will, but sort of the upper echelon of it, right? It was, you had to be educated enough to do it, but you weren't a mathematician, so you weren't that well educated. Um, and certainly this was true during, you know, well, even in say into the 60s and 70s, when this got replaced with machines rather than people, who were these people? Who were computers, say, in the 1950s and 40s? They're almost all women. Why? When well, the 40s, this ought to be obvious. Yeah, the men were all off at war. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, back in the day, particularly during the war, and this is partly why this became the, remained the case into the 50s and 60s, Early computers were essentially all women. Um, and how many of you guys have seen the movie um, Hidden Figures? Right? That tells the story of uh, a, well, the movie tells the story of three women specifically. There were obviously way more of them um, than, than what's in the movie. It was based on a book that goes into more detail about uh, more of the women. And in the case of the, the Hidden Figures movie, uh, this happened also to be a group of basically all black women that were in a segregated computing unit because it was still, you know, Jim Crow in the 50s and 60s and all of that um, crap. Um, and please open the, my file. That would be great. There we go. Okay. So I'm not much of a PowerPoint guy, but I thought... It, sometimes it's the right tool for the job. So um, let's do kind of a brief introduction to the discipline. Okay, so let's go back actually a few thousand years, because in some sense you could argue computer science is as old as dirt. Uh, has anybody ever heard of this gadget? Okay, so it's called the Antikythera mechanism. Um, and it's this thing that's got lots of wheels and gears and stuff. And it looks like a train wreck because um, this thing was actually discovered almost accidentally um, in, uh, by pearl divers in 1910, I think it was. So they're off the island of Antikythera, which is in uh, the Aegean, so it's a Greek island. And they're diving for pearls, and they happen to stumble upon an ancient shipwreck. Well, that's pretty cool. And there was lots of really cool stuff on this thing. Um, coins, other art, you know, artifacts, jewelry, stuff like that. Um, the coins actually are useful because that helps you date the shipwreck itself. Um, and... Uh, but they found pieces, you know, some big chunks of this gadget. And of course, it's all corroded and got barnacles and crap on it. Um, so take it to a museum, try and figure out what it is. And uh, it, to my knowledge, is also the example of the world's first instruction manual because it was a little plate with instructions carved on the 
you know, bolted to the side. There was just one minor problem. The instruction manual was written in ancient Greek. Um, so hope you've studied your Greek. Uh, so it's sort of this mechanical calculator computer thing. And the question is, well, what on earth is this for? Uh, and what it turns out to have been for is it can tell you when the eclipses are going to be and where the sun and moon and, and other stars are going to be, or all planets, are going to be in the sky at any given time. And you just crank it to move time forward or backwards. So it's sort of an ancient mechanical uh, astronomical calculator. Now what's amazing about this is, um, and the, the exact dating as to when this was built is still subject of a bit of a debate, but sort of somewhere in the period between 100 BC to 200 AD, somewhere in that, that range. Um, what was physics like back then? How, was the uni how did people think about the universe in that period of time? Yeah. Yeah, the Earth was at the center and everything went in circles around it, right? Uh, and then people realized, well, it can't be perfectly circles for most things because the planets kind of move backwards and forwards in the sky. So they said, okay, well, we'll put circles on circles, and these things are called epicycles, and the math suddenly gets real complicated. But it's a geocentric model of the universe. And this thing works. It can accurately predict eclipses. That's pretty cool, right? Even though it was built on a geocentric model. Okay, so uh, there's a statistician, I forget the name, who said something like, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, so yeah, if you ever take any physics, then uh, th think about that. Um, and of course, nowadays we can analyze this thing, so they've done like x-rays and CT scans and stuff on it to kind of see what's on the inside, because of course it's this corroded lump of junk basically now. Um, to, to try and reconstruct how it worked. Um, and there's kind of some competing theories on some of the details, but that's broad strokes what it was supposed to do. Um, also early, late, late, late 18th and early 19th century, uh, has anybody ever heard of a Jacquard loom? No? Okay, well, it's a loom. What are looms used for? Yeah, weaving, making cloth, right? And uh, in particular, if you want to make cloth that has some sort of pattern on it, like a plaid shirt or something, right, um, there's a lot of work to do there, okay? You could probably automate just making sort of plain, regular cloth with a, a loom, uh, but could you automate in some way the pattern making? And this guy named Chicard figured out, well, yes, yes, you could. And the way he did it was with basically these cards a little hard to see here, but you have holes in them, and the holes correspond to whether or not you're going to do, you know, one type of thread versus another, and so you could program your weaving loom to make patterned um, textiles and not have to have a human actually stitch in all the patterns. Well, that would probably be pretty useful. Right, because you could get patterned textiles, um, you know, in a more automated and efficient way, and uh, therefore make a whole bunch of money. Well, the punched card idea that stuck, and we used those for a little while. Um, so I came come back to Babbage. Babbage, one of the things that that was really important in the early 19th century. Um, in the sort of height of the British Empire uh, was navigation, right? If you're an empire that covers the entire world, right, and in this case, you know, think for everywhere from London to India, for example, is, is British domain, um, you need to get ships to and fro. Well, how do you navigate in 1820? Yes, of course, yeah, steam engines and all that hadn't been invented yet. So you're, you're on ship, tall ships with sails. Okay, that's how you sail around, but how do you actually navigate them? You've got a compass, and you got a sextant, and you got the night sky. Good luck. Okay, 
And there's a lot of really fascinating math that you would be trained in back then. Nowadays, you're not. Uh, and, you know, ships, captains, and navigators would be expected to know what's called spherical trigonometry. You guys thought regular trigonometry from high school was bad? Oh, the spherical stuff is like, like trigonometry from high school is like going to Buffalo Wild Wings and getting like medium. Uh, spherical trig is like going and getting like hot or blazon or ghost pepper. Maybe not ghost pepper. It's not that bad. Ghost pepper wings are pretty good though. Anybody ever done ghost pepper? No. You don't go over honey barbecue. I thought I was teaching men. You don't go over honey barbecue, please. Uh, all right. Anyway, so uh, but in order to do the, the the navigation, you would also need a book of tables, basically of logarithms and stuff like that. And these all had to be computed, obviously, and then printed in a book um, so that you would have an accurate set of tables. Well, if they're going to be computed by hand, there's going to be mistakes. And if they're going to be printed, you know, by people setting out block to make uh, print uh, on a press, there's going to be mistakes. And so what Babbage sought to do was to automate the entire process. Basically, let's compute it mechanically where there's no human uh, screw up possible. And then also he um, basically invented the first the first uh, uh, computer accessory, which is the printer module, and that's what's over here. And so you could compute it and print it and bam, move on. So it could make perfect tables. Uh, the only problem is he never actually finished the machine for a couple of reasons. One, he got a better idea and started working on that instead. And two, because of it, Br the British Parliament basically said, no, we're not giving you any more money and, and you know, um, stop it. Um, so, uh, so this thing was never actually constructed fully in Babbage's time. The picture here is from, um, well, basically in the, uh, I think, late, late 90s or so, um, the British Science Museum managed to find somebody with way too much money on their hands to commission a replica of the machine. We have a bunch of Babbage's parts. We certainly got all his drawings and papers. And the idea was, let's see that if we could build it with period specific, you know, basically how good metal working was in 1840, could we actually build one of these things that would work? And the answer was yes. So the rich internet guy, um, who I, I forget the, the guy's name, um, he did something, well, let me ask you guys this. How many of you seen the movie Contact? No, this is in the 90s, so, okay. There's a line in it that says, first rule of government spending. Why buy one when you could have two at twice the price? Yeah? Okay, so that's exactly what the tycoon did. He said, all right, but I don't want you to build me one. I want you to build two. So one of them is in the London Science Museum behind a glass case. The other, for a good period of time, was at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, basically right across the street from Google. If you ever find yourself in Northern California, go there. It is freaking awesome. They don't put it behind a glass case. And every afternoon at 2 o'clock, they crank this thing and print another line of the table and then talk about how the whole thing works. Um, it's now in his living room because, well, if you're a rich Internet guy, you can do that. Um, but the two things that they had to do to get it to work practically, one was to add the hand crank on the end. Okay, that seems like a reasonably obvious thing that Babbage would have deduced. And the other is that all the gears and stuff, they need a little bit of oil. Um, okay, that's also not out of the question. We put oil in our cars and stuff. Um, but choosing what oil to use on this thing actually turned out to be kind of an ordeal uh, because it was going to end up in the guy's living room. So they actually use like food safe, like cooking oil rather than, you know, WD-40 or something because the guy's wife was, you know, didn't want WD-40 in her living room. I can't say I don't blame her. Um, so he never finished it. And it's because he started working on something else, which he called the analytical engine. Because you realized very quickly that if you could build a, a geared machine to do 
math, you could build a geared machine to do logic and make decisions. And that fundamentally is what makes the difference between a computer and a calculator is the decision making process. Um, and so he started designing that, never finished it. We've again got parts and lots of drawings. Um, and to date, there is no reproduction of it. We, we, it's because the, uh, it would be probably about 10 times worse than the differential engine in terms of difficulty to build. Um, one of the people that worked with Babbage was a name, uh, lady named Ada Lovelace. Has anybody ever heard of her? Uh, well, you might have heard of her father. Has anybody ever heard of Lord Byron, the poet and Greek revolutionary and romantic and all that? That was her father. Um, and so she was basically growing up hanging out with people like Mary Shelley, um, but also was really interested in math. And you could argue that she's the, truly the world's first computer programmer uh, because of this page right here, um, where she's basically analyzing what would the different, or excuse me, what would the, uh, the um, analytical engine do for a particular kind of problem. Um, and uh, this leaf is in the, the British Library Museum, uh, worth, worth going to see if you ever find yourself in London. Um, um, okay, so we'll flash forward a little bit. Um, I'm skipping kind of one interesting thing from the 19th century, but you guys will watch some videos about that. Um, we talked about the imitation game briefly earlier. Uh, here's an enigma. Anybody know how this thing actually works? It's kind of diabolically evil. So it started actually as a commercial product before the German military took it over. Um, so here's the idea. You have a keyboard and it's in German. So this is why it's quirks instead of QWERTY because that's the German keyboard layout. Um, and then above it, you've got a bunch of lights that mirror the keyboard. And when you press a key, a light lights up uh, on, on uh, one of the other letters. And it's never the same letter as the button you press. But here's where it gets diabolical, okay? So if I wanted to scramble a message and I have the alphabet A through Z, well, I could just replace all the A's with Q's and all the B's with N's and all the C's with F's or whatever, right? If I did that and then transmitted the message, and let's say that you... I transmitted it over the radio and you heard it and wrote it all down. You'd look at it and it would be a jumbled mess. Could you figure out what it said? If, if all I did was just switch letters, you probably could figure it out pretty quickly, okay, for a couple of reasons. One, well, if it's in German, you know that it's in German, but let's say that you know it's, it's being transmitted by, the, say, the English military. Um, well, if the message is in English, what do you know about the English language? Well, what letters are more common than others? Yeah, vowels are more common, and certainly E's are probably one of the most common letters. But you know that a Q or a Z is not exactly going to be a commonly occurring letter, right? So if you look at a big pile of text and you only see like a few F's, you could probably reasonably guess that those might be Z's or other uncommon letters, okay? So if you kind of think about it for a little while, you could pretty quickly crack that, right? So that's called a substitution cipher. Um, what Enigma did was essentially it was a substitution cipher, but the substitution changed every single letter. And it did so with a bunch of wheels that you can't see in this picture and there were plug boards and stuff. And so if you hit A, 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 A on the keyboard, A would never light up, but also the letter that lit up would change every time you pressed the A key. Okay, this makes it way harder to try and crack. And what's brilliant about the machine is that it both could encode and decode. So if you had a scrambled message you would type in the scrambled message and the true message would light up on the keyboard, uh, on the, the light part, okay? But there are lots of these little rotors and plugs and stuff. 
and you had to make sure that you had yours set up the same way that the guy who transmitted the message in the beginning did. And so that part would have to be transmitted basically like, um, and there were code books that said what the settings were. So you would transmit like line 57 of page 113 out of the code book is your initial settings. And the dude on the other end would have that code book. So you had to have the code book and the military reissued these every month basically. Um, and uh, in order to get the rotors in the correct setting. Okay, So Turing and I mean he wasn't the first to work on this that Polish actually did before the Brits entered the war. Um, but all of that work got centralized at uh, Bletchley Park in England. Um, and this is where the imitation game is set, right? Um, and talks about, you know, sort of their work. So uh, basically all the mathematicians that get assigned to this all sit down and start trying to work it out, you know, figure things out by hand and using statistics and stuff. And Turing realizes, no, let's just build a machine. Um, and so he, he does. And um, of course the rest is history. Um, so on this side of the pond, uh, and also in the you know post-war period, um, the uh, the ENIAC was another computer being built, which was uh, used basically for artillery computations to make uh, artillery tables. And the idea was, if you could shrink this thing down a little bit, you could put one aboard every battleship, um, and be able to do all the the kind of complicated computations for shipborne artillery. Um, without having to do everything by hand. Um, it was, you know, horrendously complicated um, because the thing used um, vacuum tubes. Is anybody like a real big audiophile? You like listen to records on an actual record player? Any of your parents? Grandparents? Yeah. Okay, so what's a vacuum tube? So it looks, they look kind of like a light bulb, to be honest, okay? And in some sense, they, they sort of are. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but essentially the vacuum tube can be used for two purposes, either as an amplifier or as sort of a quasi-digital switch. In audio applications, that's how you use it as an amplifier. So let's say, for example, you've got a record player the signal that you get out of that record player is a very weak signal, the needle moving just barely, right? But you want to be able to hear it, so you need to amplify that signal or amplify a radio signal, so you pipe it through a vacuum tube. And nowadays we use transistors for this, but they haven't been invented yet. Um, well, like a light bulb, okay, and this is maybe where I'm starting to show my age, how many of you have actually had to change a light bulb within the last year? Okay, why did you have to change the light bulb? It burned out. Okay, what kind of light bulb were you replacing? What was the, the one that wasn't functioning anymore? You were replacing it with an LED bulb or it already was an LED? Ah, it already was an LED bulb. Oh man, kids these days. Okay, so what was it before LED bulbs? Uh, after that, but before the incandescence. They're little spirally complex fluorescents. Anybody remember those? Okay. And they, they take a little while to warm up, right? Okay. And before that were incandescents, right? Which had this tiny little tungsten filament and it would get really hot. Yeah? Well, okay. How many of you guys remember using those? Yeah. Okay. But nowadays you can't really buy them much, right? Because we have LED bulbs are much better. They last forever, they don't burn out. And in particular, they don't use nearly as much electricity and they don't put off nearly as much heat, right? A 60 watt light bulb, like an incandescent, has anybody ever touched one when it's on, right? It's a good way to burn yourself, okay? Um, whereas if you touch a 60 watt equivalent LED bulb, you'll barely feel it, right? Because it's using way less electricity. So vacuum tubes are essentially like this. One of them takes just oodles of power. And so imagine putting thousands of them together. 
right? And this is why computers took up the size of this room back in the day uh, and took just ridiculous quantities of electricity. Um, now, that wasn't the only switching technology. Um, there was actually a German, uh, and you guys will watch some videos about this that I'll, I'll post to Canvas, um, named Conrad Zusa, who used telephone relays. Those have moving parts, and so they're a little slower. They didn't use quite as much electricity, and they didn't burn out as often, but they were slower than vacuum tubes. Um, okay, here's Turing. Um, what's the story about Turing? Well, those of you who've seen the imitation game know the answer, but what was so special about Turing, or not? Other than being brilliant, what else was he? Huh? Very gay. Yes. And that was a problem in 1950s England. Uh, in fact, it was still a criminal offense to be gay uh, back then. And it wasn't until 2000-something that uh, the British government basically apologized. So essentially, he got caught being with another dude. And since that was a crime at the time, he was stripped of his security clearance, so he couldn't work on, you know, code breaking and stuff, uh, but also he was offered, okay, you can either have hormone injections to suppress your libido, or you can go to prison. Which would you choose? Huh? Which is what he did, right? And basically, you know, long story short, he eventually commits suicide. Um, and, you know, one of the most brilliant people in the 20th century, you know, up there with Einstein, right? Um, and that's, that's what happens. Um, so another lady, uh, this side of the pond, here's Grace Hopper. Um, she was a mathematician and taught at a women's college. Um, and then when the war broke out, she basically joined the Navy because that's where she could be useful. Um, and um, was, so here she is in civilian clothing. Here she is in her uniform. She's actually the person, the oldest active duty person in the U.S. military history. I mean, she's dead now, of course, but um, she retired as a um, rear admiral lower half. Well, Commodore, but um, Commodore doesn't exist anymore as a rank. It's rear admiral lower half. Um, and essentially what happened is she would retire. Then they would find some problem they couldn't figure out, and they'd be like, Grace, help. And they'd bring her back out of retirement. So she was still on active duty, like you think even during Reagan's administration, which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah. So, um, okay. So in the 50s, this thing gets invented, the transistor. Well, 1947. But, uh, and there's lots and lots of different kinds, and we'll talk about it, sort of a couple categories of them. But these things were brilliant because there were no moving parts. But the, and they also were solid state. They took up way less space than a vacuum tube and way less energy. So if a vacuum tube is the size of a light bulb, this thing is the size of the fingernail on your pinky, roughly. Okay, that's a lot better. Um, and so one of the first commercial applications of this were in radios because for the amplification part, but they also could be used to build computers. Okay, so Bell Labs, here are the guys who invented it. Um, and then they realized, okay, well, if we can build one of these, we could build thousands of them, right? And maybe we could build thousands of them and kind of weave them together, if you will, on a little piece of silicon, almost like a textile. And this born... Uh, gave us what we now call the integrated circuit, basically, where you put everything onto a single piece of silicon and the, you know, the rest is, is history. You know, at first, the integrated circuits had maybe 10 transistors and then hundreds and then thousands, and then now they have billions. Um, and obviously, the more transistors, the more computational power. Um, okay, so here's what a chip might look like today. Uh, so the chip that you see is this, you know, this big thing, but the actual part that's um, uh, the ch what truly is the chip is just this tiny little piece on the inside. 
Um, so this one is, is uh, made deliberately with sort of a cutaway so you can see what's inside the thing. Um, and so you could fit billions or millions of transistors on a thing that is now the size of your finger. Um, and so this is how we've gone from computers that took up the size of a room to computers that took up the size of a refrigerator to computers that you can carry in your backpack to computers that you can wear on your wrist. Okay. And, you know, an Apple watch, the processor in that is more powerful than the entire Apollo computing program, everything, right. Which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but yeah. Um, Integrated circuits allowed for microcomputers, so things that would fit on your desk. Here's a picture of an Apple One, which they sold as a kit, um, basically all the pieces, and you had to assemble it yourself, um, and including the case, which is this sort of somewhat janky-looking wood case. I mean, it was the 70s, guys. Like, people were going to Woodstock and smoking lots of weed and, um, well... Maybe the weed part is still the same, but people were doing lots of acid. And um, so, um, and they all had bell bottoms and long hair. And um, yeah. Um, so in 1984, Apple released this thing, Macintosh. Um, and it's particularly famous. Has anybody seen the Super Bowl commercial from 1984 that Apple put out? It is literally the best commercial ever. Um, I'll post a link to it on YouTube. It is epic. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah. Um, and then nowadays, right, we talk about supercomputers. So you've got, for example, this is a, a picture of IBM Roadrunner. Now the computers take up the size of big rooms again. But it's not just one computer, it's like lots of them that are built and linked together with high-speed interfaces that you can throw at really, really big problems like modeling the weather or um, nuclear weapons or, um, yeah, stuff like that. And then one of the big modern in, uh, innovations, the, the thing that's, you know, nowadays hot is AI and uh, using basically graphics cards for neural networks. Um, and you can build supercomputer class size of this. How many of you guys have heard of ChatGPT? Yeah? How many of you guys have used ChatGPT? How many of you guys have used ChatGPT to write a paper for you and then turned it in? Really? No? Yeah, well, uh, got a good uh, hint, don't, okay? Um, and on that subject, pay attention, shameless plug, to this week's Bachelor and next week's Bachelor, um, because Professor Dunaway and I have, uh, have a couple of uh, things that we're going to publish about that for you guys, about ChatGPT. Um, yeah, so, okay, so some of you guys have used ChatGPT. So what did you put into ChatGPT, for example? Somebody that's actually used it. No snitching. Uh, oh, honey, we, we, we know about this. We knew about it before you guys did. So don't even think that we're not, yeah. So what could you put into it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And it, it, it's better than a search engine in some sense because it can also give you like a, almost like a summary of something or like, let's say that you wanna know what was the Antikythera mechanism? It can give you like a one-page paper, roughly, uh, that explains some of this stuff and maybe even gives you some references, okay? That's kind of cool. Um, it'll also be interesting to see it be used for like uh, digital assistance. So like, let's say you're, like if you have trouble finding a reference for something, what do you do? Well, you go to the library and you sit down with, with Beth or somebody Right, and, and you go through the catalog together and, and, and try and find stuff. Well, what about if an AI could also help you do that or accelerate how fast you and Beth were able to work? Kind of useful, right? Well, where's the nefarious part of this chat GPT? Huh? 
Now, it's not 100% reliable. It's terrible at even freshman calculus, okay? But also, yeah, garbage in, garbage out, we say. But let's say that you say, hey, chat GPT, write me a two-page paper on Ada Lovelace. And it'll spit something out. And it's pretty good. And what, ha what do you do with that paper? Well, okay, you better. Oh, no, it is. Right, it knows basically the, the, maybe not the entirety of the internet, but up until 2021 or so, it knows, you know, current events from that period, right? It's not internet connected in the sense that it doesn't know what happened in the news yesterday, but it does know basically, I won't say everything, but tons of stuff from 2021 backwards, okay? Yeah, it can. Yeah. Um, but it also can be uncannily good about even technical stuff. So, for example, uh, I gave it a question, uh, and I put this actually on one of my finals last semester. I said, told Jeff, Jeff GPT, write a program in this language. You're either really early or super late. Okay. Uh, chat GPT in this language to do X. That's something that I would ask my students to do in this class. And it outputs some stuff. And then their problem on the exam was, well, how good is this? And it was pretty good in some respects, but also pretty deficient in others. Okay. Um, so yeah, everybody in the humanities is freaking out because now the papers won't get assigned anymore because you'll just have AIs write them. Um, they're kind of getting ahead of themselves a little bit, but this is what higher ed is, is worried about nowadays, um, is that, you know, we're going to basically, the AI is going to put us out of business because now you don't have to learn anything. Yeah. And eventually, you know, we'll have one of these, uh, self-driving car. Okay. I mean, here's a Tesla, right? By the way, if anybody wants to know the price for an A in this class, you're looking at it. Um, you know, a Tesla Model S Plaid along with a one-way ticket to a non-extradition treaty country for me and the Tesla. Um, and, okay. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, so that's just a brief overview of what computer science is as a discipline and some of the parts. Um, and pay attention to Canvas. Uh, I'll get it published here in an hour or two. Um, and you'll have your first couple of assignments, one of which is to... Um, Basically, think a little bit about what ethical computing is. I mean, it's kind of like when you guys were freshmen and at orientation, what did they have like 15,000 things on? Plagiarism in the gentleman's world. And you know what? That's the worst time to give you those lectures. Why? Because does anybody plagiarize during the first week of classes? No. When does that happen? During finals week. I busted six people last semester. Four of them are no longer at the college. Okay, so don't don't mess with me on that. Okay, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, but also uh, a couple of um, uh, a documentary series that it's a little dated now. I really wish somebody would update it. But um, WGBH Boston, in the very early '90s, did a six-part, five or six-part documentary on uh, basically the history of computing up until that point. And the last episode is kind of forward-looking from what people thought would be happening in the early 90s. And that's kind of hilarious to see how right they were about some stuff and wrong they were about some others. But it goes into a lot more detail about a lot of these other things. I hope you guys will find it really interesting. So um, anyway, all right, see you guys on Wednesday. And uh, be ready to get your hands dirty Wednesday with screwdrivers.